Well, good evening, everybody. Wonderful to be here. Thank you to IC Qatar for hosting me this evening. And thank you for all of you for, for coming out in, in such large numbers. I uh, wanted to start to, you know, this evening's uh, proceedings you know, with a few observations just about the events that are transpiring around the world. I, I think Brian put it quite well. I mean, these are quite extraordinary times. We you know we see the winds of change beginning to blow across the Middle East as people aspiring to freedom are able to connect and collaborate more readily than at any time in history. We see the rise of new global powers, right? We're no longer in a world where there is one dominant superpower. We see the rise of China, India, Brazil, a whole range of new you know, economies, new countries that are beginning to affect the balance of power. At the same time, we see unprecedented global challenges. We see the rise of climate change becoming a global issue. Food prices are, are rising. We see water shortages around the world. All of these kind of challenges will begin to you know, test the true limits of human ingenuity. And at the same time, of course, the subject that I'm here to talk about this evening, we've had the digital revolution, which probably more than anything else has really started to revolutionize the way that we connect and, and communicate with our friends and the family, the way that we work. Um, it started to transform major industries like media, entertainment, software, pharmaceuticals. But more than anything, I think it has started to change you know, the very mode of, of human organization. It changes the way that we organize ourselves as businesses, as governments, as universities. And you know, the, the metaphor I would use is that you know, the organizations today are becoming less like the hierarchy of the old bureaucracies of the past and increasingly like social networks in the sense that they are highly distributed. They're able to connect with and tap into talent and skills around the world. They're able to you know, innovate with greater ingenuity, you know, more dynamism, more agility than ever before, in part because we have this global fabric of connectivity and this platform for collaboration and innovation provided by the internet. Again, you know, we think this is, a, this is a highly revolutionary force, but it's not the first time in history where we've seen this kind of profound change. And I think it's, it's worth you know, reflecting on the fact that these kind of punctuation points, these points in history where we have profound change, have come at, you know, with fairly irregular intervals. And I think the, the analogy we use in our most recent book is, of course, the printing press. The invention of the printing press by Gutenberg about 500 years ago, just over 500 years ago, started a process of broadening the distribution of knowledge and power, right? For the first time, the feudal kings and monarchs could not dominate you know, discourse and politics. They couldn't control religion. They couldn't control science. For the first time, people everywhere be able to, were able to communicate and share knowledge and information. We saw the rise of scientific communities. We saw the rise of an educated class and new political freedoms. And those you know, freedoms and that ability to print and distribute information more broadly led to the eventual rise of industrial capitalism, the Reformation, the scientific enlightenment, and ultimately the modern uh, democracies that we see flourishing across most of the world. And it's quite possible that we see a similar process unfolding today. You know, as the internet continues this long historical trajectory of you know, broadening the distribution of knowledge and power in society, that institutions are again in flux. You know, that we're, we're seeing deep changes to government and democracy, we're seeing changes to science, we're seeing changes to healthcare and many other institutions. And we think that, you know, that sets the stage for a very exciting time in history. Now, you may be wondering, you know, how does this relate to me individually and what can I take away from this evening's talk? And I want to suggest, you know, two things. I mean, I'll certainly impart my thoughts on how the digital revolution is beginning to change all of these various institutions. But I also want to you know, offer you something a little bit more tangible, too, and, and give you a sense that you as individuals, too, have an unprecedented opportunity as a result of the digital revolution. Because what we have found in our research across all of the various sectors of industry that we've looked at, across many of the institutional shifts that we've begun to document in, in the books that we have written, this opportunity that you know, individuals can now be change agents in ways that wasn't possible before. They can, you know, connect and collaborate and, and shape the course of history themselves. In some respects, you know, they can participate 
more deeply in, in, in you know, co-creating public services, for instance, or participate more deeply in shaping their health care or shaping their educational experience, and that can be profoundly empowering. Now, at the same time, you know, there could be downsides to digital revelation, too, and we'll reflect a, a little bit on that. But I do think that this opportunity that we have today uh, is, is exciting, and that's one of the things that I want to impart tonight. Now, I thought I would, I would start this evening by you know, telling you a little bit about how I came to truly appreciate the value of the Internet and, and the digital revolution in it. It started in 1994. I was working as a uh, news producer in a, a small campus community radio station in Toronto, Canada, where I live. And I, you know, every day we prepared to, to do the news broadcast at 5 p.m. And we started very early in the morning, about 8 a.m. in the morning, and we would sit around and read the morning's newspapers. We would collect all of the newspapers from Toronto, including the, you know, the local community papers, and we would have a look through the papers and, and try to decide you know, which of these stories is most pertinent to our audience. And then, you know, that, that was a, a sort of interesting way, you know, for us to find out, okay, what's relevant? And then we would look for people to interview that we could have live on our, our news program every day. And we would invite them, you know, to have conversations with us. And that would be the essence of how we gathered our news. And then, in 1994, one day, we had a computer science student. And he connected a few computers to then, which was a, a very, you know, early stage internet, a very text-based internet. And all of a sudden, our process for gathering news changed fundamentally because we were no longer reliant on the local newspapers. Suddenly, we had access to this you know, vast world of information that you know, for us didn't exist previously. We could connect to sources of news uh, around the world very easily. We weren't limited to what you know, editors had decided was the most relevant news of the day. We could find out what was happening across the world. And most of our audience were new immigrants from South Asia, from Africa, from across the Caribbean. And all of a sudden, we could actually develop and, and tap into news stories that were very relevant to them because we could source the news, as I said, from around the world. And that, to me, really, you know, for that, that was really exciting and that was empowering because I had access to all this information. But that was really just the first iteration of the web. That was, you know, what we called the... In, in our, our book, Wikonomics, we called the publish and browse web because in many ways, you know, when we have a new communication technology, our tendency is to impose you know, the old mental models of the previous technologies and the new techno on, the, on the new phenomenon, right? So we, we tended to initially think about the internet as an extension of the publishing medium. It was a bit of a, a broadcast approach to the internet in the sense that our experience was largely about, you know, viewing very, you know, static... Uh, websites. And what we have seen since then is the internet has matured and we've started to really understand its inherent power to enable interactivity and communication was that you know, what, was, what was really unique about this new generation of websites was that many people are no longer just passive receivers of content. They are actually able to engage, to co-create, to create content in ways that weren't possible before. And we saw the rise of, of YouTube, of, of Wikipedia, of all of these user-generated sites, you know, Flickr being another example, where, again, you know, the, the, the difference was is that, you know, rather than just passively receive the information, you could get engaged in creating the information. And that was, I think, what really cued us to this important phenomenon that we wrote about in Wikonomics, that this was a, a big change, not just in, 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 the, in, the, you know, in the technology, but in the way that we use the technology to affect social change or you know, to innovate as, as businesses. And the metaphor that you know, we often use to describe this shift is that you know, rather than think of the internet as an information highway, as a more sophisticated you know, pipe, if you will, for delivering information to audiences, you know, think about it as a global computer that in many ways, everyone can program. Because if you are updating your Twitter, if you are modifying entries on Wikipedia, if you're updating your Facebook profile, in some small but you know, ultimately significant way, you are helping to program the global internet. You are adding to this vast tapestry of knowledge. And of course, when you have two billion people connected to the internet who are engaged in this kind of content creation, it is ultimately a very staggering, you know, rate of, of, of evolution, of, of creation, of, of new content. You know, every single day, just, you know, the data, the information that people are contributing is exploding in a phenomenal way. Now, at the same time, 
and this is more recently, we, we started to know, notice a, a shift in the way that people consume information too. And, you know, I like to think about this as a, as a, a bit of a shift from, you know, a search-based web where, you know, the way that we access information was through Google. We would search for information and Google would pull up a list of links. Well, you know, a lot of people would start to complain about this sense of information overload and not being able to navigate or find, you know, quality sources of information. But what we're seeing is that social networking is adding this new kind of layer to the way that we retrieve and access information because through Twitter, you know, if you follow the right people, you can get access to very high quality information and your social network in a sense becomes the way that you parse information, the way that you, did, you know, distinguish between poor quality information or high quality information. And for me it's become enormously useful. You know, if, if I look for experts on the future of energy or the future of biotechnology or nanotechnology or other fields, you know, I can, I can feel like I'm actually plugged into what, are the, well, you know, what is the latest thinking? What are the latest developments? And you get it straight from the source, you know, the people who are actually at the forefront of these kind of innovations. So this, this kind of social layer on the web itself is, is hugely transformative. And many people are beginning to think that these kind of social connections, you know, that your network, in a sense, will start to affect many other things that we do on the web, including, if you think about it, it already is affecting the way that we purchase things because you get recommendations through Amazon. You know, other people who have similar tastes, for instance, if, if you share certain tastes or, or buying patterns, it will recommend similar books. And this happens on, you know, with movies and music and chances are it could extend to other where areas like finding a good physician or, or finding, you know, an educational institution that fits your unique skills or your unique interests or needs. So this... Um, is, is, is quite interesting. Now, in parallel with these shifts, we've begun to see this um, change where the dominant way that we access the web increasingly is through the mobile phone. And again, this is another you know, thing that's happening in parallel with this change in the way that you know, we view the web overall. I, it was amazing to me, we were doing research for the new book, and I was looking at uh, energy, actually, and, and, and a case study on Tanzania, where they are beginning to, you know, exploit new forms of solar energy. And what I found was that, and this was quite remarkable, that, you know, 10% of Tanzanians could access a modern electrical grid, but 97% reported that they could access a mobile phone. You know, so the, the kind of, you know, access issues that we have seen in the past, it's not to say that the digital divide has disappeared by any stretch, but certainly, the widespread availability of mobile phones is beginning to you know, increase the number of connected people. They estimated um, quite recently that by the end of last year there were five billion mobile subscriptions. Now, some people have multiple subscriptions, so you have to you know, factor out some of that, but certainly at least half of humanity has access today to a mobile phone, which means you know, the vast majority of people can or you know, a majority of people can now access the web. And, and that has you know, huge implications, I think, as we go forward. One of the implications is that people can now connect to op, you know, economic opportunity in a way that wasn't possible in the past. I recently came across this company called TextEagle, and they figure you know, through mobile networks they can start to take the, the typical kind of uh, offshoring and outsourcing to a new level. They can start to farm out tasks to people who are connected to mobile phones. Now this may start out as fairly you know, small tasks, things like translating documents, for instance, could be done quite readily over a mobile phone. Um, sometimes they do this for you know, transcribing even medical records. Uh, in some cases, companies have experimented with this, but you could kind of see where this is evolving, you know, that billions of people who are currently on the periphery of the economy can now you know, get access not just, to, not just to jobs, but potentially to all kinds of, of different economic opportunity or opportunities for crowdsourcing. And this is a big opportunity for companies as well and their ability to find new sources of skills and new sources of talent. Now, the other thing that I think is remarkable about the mobile phone is that, of course, it, it's no longer just a device for, for talking or even just accessing, you know, the web. Increasingly, it's going to give us access to this vast, you know, library of recorded information. And I remember, you know, recently hearing uh, Kevin Kelly talk, who, Kevin Kelly was the co-founder of Wired magazine, and, 
you know, he talked about you know, the fact that a, a couple of years ago, you know, the idea of storing all of recorded you know, knowledge and, and human uh, culture, you know, all of the movies and, and uh, books and so forth that have been written over the course of history, you would need a hard drive probably half the size of this room in order to store it all. And that's not to say that you know, Moore's Law is proceeding at such a pace that you'll be able to store all that information on your phone, but what you do have with broadband networks is the ability to retrieve that information from what people call the cloud, you know, the ability to access it on demand. And again, here, you know, that's another you know, fairly revolutionary idea that you know, within the next five years or, or, or even less potentially, that this kind of access to all of recorded knowledge will become possible for a large part of humanity. Now, you know, the mobile space I think is, is fascinating in part because, you know, the global connectivity of course is, is influential, but what a lot, a lot of people are finding is that it's the access to people nearby, you know, people who you have um, shared affiliations or shared goals or shared interests with, you know, this is the Foursquare phenomenon or other local social networks that are allowing people to discover things in their neighborhood um, because of the fact that you know, they can see very readily you know people who may be connected to them on Facebook you know if they happen to be co-located in the same city or they can get access to you know reviews about restaurants or other local happenings you know that allows them to you know feel more connected to the places in which they live so the you know, the local and the global interconnectivity is quite important and I came across, you know, this interesting example, uh, an MIT experiment, you know, just the other day. It's called WikiCity Rome, and, and what they have realized is that by, you know, the tracing of GPS signals, they can actually take, in essence, the real-time pulse of a city. And this is, you can look this up yourself, you can go to WikiCity Rome, just if you Google that, you can pull up the information. And they have this interesting little animation. Essentially what they've done is over a 24 hour time period, they've looked at you know, the, the flow of the population throughout Rome, throughout the city, you know, based on, on the movement of, of cell phone signals. And what that allows you to do is, is see the real movement of people. You can see you know, kind of the life of the city illustrated in a very short time span. And for urban planners, that means they can begin to optimize infrastructure or, or planning decisions around the actual flow of information, not just the flow or the flow of people, rather, rather than you know the kind of uses of infrastructure that they've predicted. So, for instance, you know, think about transportation networks. You know, are you know you could know by by looking at all these GPS signals, you know, where are the people in the city and are the buses where the people are. You know, in essence, you know, are we optimizing our transportation system to match what actually happens in reality? Now, things get potentially even more interesting when you think about, you know, the fact that, you know, because of what they call geolocation or location-based technologies, you know, your phone, because of its GPS signal, knows where you are and you can tag information with a geographic location as well that it becomes possible in a sense to browse the physical world that and in essence, what you have is the ability to layer a whole you know, vast array of, of virtual information over the physical world so that if you're a tourist in a new city, you can point your phone at a particular building and it can describe to you the historical context or it could tell you, for instance, that that building happens to be for sale. Um, it could do all kinds of you know, interesting things. I mean, the, the ability to layer information, you know, virtual information over a physical space is potentially endless. Um, they have talked about this idea that users, uh, individual, you and I, could actually annotate the physical world. So I could leave what's called a virtual sticky note for my friends saying, last week I was at this restaurant and they have great Hawaiian pizza, you should check it out. So that when my friend actually passes that restaurant, they get a little notice on their phone that says, oh, Anthony was at that restaurant and he liked the Hawaiian pizza, so go check it out. Um, or your roommate is, is coming home from work and you leave a little virtual sticky note outside of the grocery store saying, hey, we're out of milk, could you pick something up on the way home? I mean, these are the kind of possibilities. I mean, these are just little anecdotes, but you can imagine, you know, the ability to layer all of this virtual information will give us much more rich information about the world around us. It, it doesn't prevent us from engaging with people or the environment, but it, it really does amplify the amount of information available to us. And this, you know, this is, is one of my favorite examples when we talk about, you know, digital technologies and mobile innovation and where it's going. 
Uh, Nokia recently developed what they call an eco-sensor phone, which means that it has little sensors embedded in the phone that are able to detect air pollution. You know, at a very granular level, different types of pollutants. So you can imagine a scenario where you know, millions or potentially billions of people have these kind of eco-sensors plugged into their phone. As a matter of course, it becomes kind of the standard part of the architecture of a phone. That for, you know, for the first time, we could be getting planetary feedback on air pollution in real time around the world. And in order to test that proposition, they did a little experiment in San Francisco. And what they did is they, they essentially took these, these sensors and they, they equipped them to the street sweepers that drive around San Francisco all day long. So as these street sweepers are driving along San Francisco, they're taking regular air quality measurements at a, at a, at a certain interval. And as they're, you know, as they're taking these air quality measurements, they're reporting it back to a central database. So that in essence, what you see in real time again is, is a really granular map of air pollution across the city. And then you can start to develop new public services. So for the first time, you know, somebody could receive a text alert on a day in which air pollution in their neighborhood is very high. And if you have asthma, that could be a real life and death concern, right? So for you could, for instance, sign up to the service and when you enter an area where, you know, in which air pollution was, was particularly bad, you could receive a little alert saying, put on your mask or step inside indoors. So these are, are pretty amazing possibilities, but in, in some ways it goes even further. And, and this is part of a, a broader shift that people have described in terms of the evolution of information technologies going from connected computers to connected phones to ultimately connected everything where the internet becomes pervasive, ubiquitous, embedded in all kinds of different products, even, yes, your underpants in some respect, because this is a prototype that scientists have recently developed in which that little carbon electrode on the underwear actually monitors your vitals, including your heart rate, your glucose level, and that kind of information could then be reported back to your personal health record, for instance, or for someone who is managing a chronic condition, that information can be reported directly to your physician so that they could remotely monitor the status of your health. At the same time, you know, we see farmers fields that are connected to the internet because they are beginning to communicate with satellites and they can monitor, you know, the soil moisture. They can, you know, decide, you know, do we need to irrigate the field a little bit better? And a lot of this can be you know, automated. You know, transportation systems are again are becoming much more intelligent because cars have sensors that can, can you know, they can, uh, they can detect problems on the road. For instance, if your car drives over a pothole, it could report that information directly back to the local officials so that they could, you know, uh, dispatch people to repair it. Um, we can start to predict traffic flows much more accurately. In fact, we can begin to reroute traffic in fact, Google Maps is, is already beginning to do this. When you ask for directions on Google Maps, they're starting to use satellite-based information to not just give you, you know, the route that they give everyone, but rather to give you the route that makes the most sense at that particular moment in time because of existing traffic patterns. So the, the kind of information that we get you know, about our environment is just becoming richer and richer and, and more detailed and more granular, giving this, you know, essentially what, what people have described as a central nervous system for the Earth. So that is, in, in, in I guess, about 10 or 15 minutes, my kind of very quick overview of, of you know, where the digital revolution has been and, and where it's going from a technology perspective. But, you know, what I want to emphasize this evening and spend most of my time talking about is, is the imp impact ultimately on people and communities, because I think that's where the really profound and interesting things begin to happen. The technology itself, of course, is, is fascinating, but it's, it's what it does, you know, to us as, as individuals and, and our ability to collaborate and share information that I think is, is most revolutionary. And, you know, there's two ways that we can potentially come at this. You know, one is a lot of people have begun to think about, well, what does this do to us as individuals? You know, especially the, you know, this first generation of young people that are growing up in this hyper-stimulating digital world. Does it, you know, change us as people? Does it have lasting generational effects? And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that, yes, that is in fact the case. Um, they've, you know, started to study young people today, and I think the research is, is still a little bit preliminary to make 
you know, definitive conclusions, but they're suggesting that you know, young people are you know, developing different cognitive abilities in part because of this experience growing up always using digital technologies. And some of this may be good and some of it may actually be bad. You know, they, they worry, for instance, about attention spans and whether people have the cognitive capacity now to you know, engage with long, complex text you know, in an in a age where you know, it's much more likely that people are paying attention to the very instantaneous uh, kind of information you would get on Twitter, for instance. But on the other hand, there was an interesting study done on, on surgeons, and they compared young surgeons and elder surgeons in terms of their proficiency in, in the profession. And they had a, an interesting and surprising result. They found that even though the older surgeons were much more experienced, the younger surgeons were actually more capable. And they had a hypothesis, again, a hypothesis which, you know, we still have to see, you know, through repeated tests whether this is true, but they suggested that young people were actually better at conducting surgery because they had grown up playing dig video games and they were very dexterous. They had very fine motor skills in their hands. And in part because surgery today, especially microscopic surgery, is increasingly mediated through computers, they are much more familiar with the kind of techniques and the technology for conducting surgery. So that was a very important and interesting insight. You know, the main point being is that Certainly this will begin to change us as individuals and will have lasting generational effects. But what I want to, you know, my you know, main interest is, is how it affects human communities and the way they organize. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, what's fascinating to me is that, you know, human communities today no longer revolve solely around geographic proximity, so the people in your immediate neighborhood and they don't necessarily just revolve around professional affiliations either. I mean, the, the point is that today you can organize a community around virtually any shared endeavor, any shared goal, any shared aspiration. And, and you know, the fact is, is that you're able to connect with you know, hundreds, even thousands of people who may share those aspirations irregardless of, of geography, enabling all kinds of niche communities to form. And, you know, we've seen the impact of this, of course, you know, recently, you know, starting with Iran and, and more recently with Egypt and Tunisia and, of course, what's happening in Libya as we speak today. You know, the ability of, of young people to connect and share information. Now, I think, you know, there's a, a very interesting debate happening in, in my field and uh, among, you know, various commentators about, you know, what is the true effect of, of Twitter and Facebook on these kind of revolutions? Is it a determining force? Is it merely one factor among many? I think. Of course, there's a lot of factors here, including, you know, the economic situation and, and the fact that you have large, youthful populations. But there's no denying the fact that, you know, this fabric of connectivity allows people to share information and organize much more efficiently than in the past. And we see this in our approach to global problems, too, the way that we um, organize around issues like climate change, for instance. This is... Um, an interesting example we came across in, in preparing for the new book as we were researching and you know we were a little bit skeptical of the ability of, of governments to ultimately regulate this process because it, it, it's proven very difficult to get any kind of even national based consensus let alone a consensus on an international level about how to tackle this problem but you know what we found is that across the world there are thousands of, of individual mass collaborations if you will you know from the local community through to the international level, people beginning to organize around this issue. And one of the interesting responses has been something called Carbon Rally. So the, the basic premise is that we can all take individual actions that will make a difference in terms of you know, protecting the climate or protecting the environment in our daily lives. And when we take those actions as individuals, it can sometimes feel like we're you know, a very small drop in, in the overall bucket. It doesn't feel like our individual action has a great deal of consequence. But if you can organize tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people to take the same action all at once, you know, the impact can feel much more significant because you're part of a larger crowd and community of people that are undertaking stuff in solidarity. So what Carbon Rally does is every week, they announce a new challenge. You know, one week it might be, you know, we're going to change our driving patterns. You know, we're going to you know, use more public transit. Or next week it might be, we're going to wash our clothes in cold water. Or we're going to, you know, we're going to undertake actions to conserve energy. And so, you know, people subscribe to these challenges and, you know, 40,000 people doing that collectively all at the same time measuring their impact 
makes people feel like they're, they're making a much more larger and more significant uh, uh, contribution. And what you've seen is that high schools have started to get involved so that you have you know, different high schools challenging one another and even companies are getting involved. So you could see you know, large companies saying, well, you know, which of us in a competitive situation can be the most energy efficient, Google versus Microsoft? Or you know, think about it in terms of <clears throat> large scale political institutions, the US Congress versus the European Parliament or you know, that kind of idea. You, know, you, could, you could get institutions involved in a, in a very uh, significant way to drive change. Now, the point that we made in our book is that, you know, the social networking and the ability for communities to organize is, is, is very interesting and very important, but there's a big change happening in, in the very nature of business and, the, and, and arguably this social networking that, you know, we have been talking about has become a new mode of social production where for the first time in history, you know, individuals can actually create products and services without you know, the usual kind of you know, modus operandi of having a large um, structured you know, top-down corporation. You know, so a, a great example of this and one of the definitive examples of this, of course, is Wikipedia. You know, the first peer-produced encyclopedia, uh, arguably the largest repository of human knowledge in the world, free human knowledge for that matter. Um, with 3.5 million articles, it's about 15 times larger than its closest competitor, Encyclopedia Britannica. 15 times larger. Um, you know, it's been translated into 200 different languages. Again, all of this done on a volunteer basis. They have about 10 full-time employees. They've had you know, millions of people who have made contributions in some form. And that's not to say everyone makes a same or equal contribution because they find if you look carefully at the social dynamics and the organization of the community, actually there's a hardcore repository of about 50,000 people who, who do a lot of the heavy lifting. And, and that's quite natural and expected when you look at kind of the, the nature of communities generally. I'll, I'll talk about Linux in a minute too. The open source software system, you see very much the same kind of structure where you have a large community of people who may do, you know, small, make small contributions or edits, but you have, you know, this very engaged and passionate community that does things like adding all the hyperlinks and uploading images and, and actually moderating debates. You know, when you have, you know, different or contrasting points of view about a particular article, a lot of people get involved to, to help, you know, uh, moderate those kind of debates over content. But, you know, in many ways, you know, what was remarkable to us, you know, when we first saw Wikipedia was that, at least according to economic and political theory, this kind of mass collaboration on that kind of scale shouldn't even be possible. I mean, if you would ask somebody, you know, a couple of decades ago, could you create an encyclopedia without a traditional publishing company, you know, just involving millions of volunteers, nobody would have said that that was even possible. They said, no, that would, that would never happen. It's not possible. And yet, they found that you know, through the right division of labor and by putting in place a, you know, a kind of um, uh, a mission, you know, a shared goal, a shared mission of, of making all of this knowledge you know, free and available to the world, they were able to organize people on a very large scale. You know, Linux was a, a very similar kind of example. You know, the world's first open source operating system. Well, when Linus Torvalds, the guy who originated Linux, first posted the operating system to the web, again, he had really no idea what was going to unfold from there. He was a university student in Helsinki. And you know, he asked for you know, some help from fellow programmers to help perfect this operating system. And within a couple of days, he had three to five suggestions. And within a couple of weeks, all of a sudden, he had hundreds of interested people. And then over the, a couple of years, you know, a couple hundred people turned into a, several thousand. And pretty soon, they had this you know, large dispersed community of software programmers around the world who were all united and passionate about this idea of creating a free open source operating system that anybody could program and share with the world and that this act of, of creating open source software would transform software and make it widely available to users who had never been able to afford or, or use that kind of software in the past. Now, the traditional software companies, as you might expect, didn't think that this was a very credible uh, operating system at all. They said, oh, Linux will never have the robustness or completeness of a proprietary operating system. They don't have the management controls, the quality controls, you know, 
how could a loose, you know, organization of, of software programmers with, with no CEO and, you know, no paychecks possibly compete with Microsoft or Sun or Oracle or other large software providers? And they dismissed it. But, you know, lo and behold, you look at it today and Linux is running 80% of the world's web servers. It's embedded in thousands of different consumer products, you know, from TiVos to even BMWs use Linux as, as the background operating system in the car. You know, we found out that Germany uses Linux for some of its air traffic control systems and even running some of its nuclear power plants. So in many ways, you know, Linux has become pervasive. And you know, last year I was at the Linux annual user forum in, in Tokyo and you know, the president of the Linux Foundation said, you know, there's not a person in the modern world that doesn't use Linux every single day, often without even knowing it, because Again, with 80% of the world's web servers, every time you access Google, you are, uh, you know, even without knowing it, using Linux in many ways. Um, China is probably the biggest, the world's largest user of Linux uh, anywhere. Um, they've decided essentially to, to put their entire government infrastructure on an open source based system. So this kind of, and actually, you know, let me make this point too, because a lot of people say, oh, well, it's free software. Doesn't that just take away from the private sector? Doesn't that, you know, kill jobs? And, and they say, no, actually, in fact, you know, Linux, the ecosystem creates about $50 billion worth of economic value every single year. And this is, you know, the operating system may be free, but all of the consulting advice, the maintenance and support, the contracts for installing Linux in, in large enterprises, that creates a lot of value. All of the products that I described, you know, from the TiVos to the Motorola Razors, all of the, you know, consumer electronics that embed Linux, you know, if you count that as part of the ecosystem, it actually makes a huge contribution to economic growth. And by the way, you know, companies like IBM and other large companies that have since started to support Linux, you know, because they see that this is a real viable operating system, have estimated that if you wanted to create Linux from scratch, using proprietary software development methods, you'd have to spend about $10 billion in terms of total investment of human capital over many, many years to replicate that effort. So it's a, a pretty stunning accomplishment. So then the big question was, if you can create an operating system, or if you can create the world's largest encyclopedia using mass collaboration without traditional management controls, without traditional paychecks and incentive systems, you know, what else could you do? What else could you create? And, and how could large traditional companies potentially take advantage of this? And that's where we stumbled across Procter & Gamble, you know, which, which again became one of our showcase examples in the first book, Wikinomics. And, and here was the issue. It was about the year 2000. Procter & Gamble was going through a real rough patch. You know, their stock price had declined. Their innovation success rate had flatlined. They said, look, you know, we're putting all of this money into internal R&D and we're not generating more innovative products and services. You know, what can we do about this? And the, the CEO said, we're going to do something radical. In the next 10 years, we're going to source 50% of all of our new products and services from outside of the company. And of course, the R&D people said, you're nuts. You'll never be able to do it. I mean, where are you going to get all these good ideas from and how are you going to do it? They said, well, you know, we've done a bit of an analysis and, and we've, uh, uh, we've looked at, you know, the whole world of, uh, of science and, and various universities and discovered that, you know, we may employ 9,000 of the world's smartest people in chemistry and biology and other related science fields, but for every one of the 9,000 that work for us full time, we've identified another 200 who are just as good, people in research universities, other companies, startups, all kinds of, of different places. And if you're quick with numbers, you'll realize that that's 1.8 million people who they could potentially tap into. 1.8 million people. Now, there's no company on the planet that can afford to employ 1.8 million people full time. But what P&G realized that because of this approach of mass collaboration, because of the internet, they could begin to tap into that skill, that's, you know, that talent pool, in a way that was much more efficient, in a way that was you know, more ad hoc or on an as needed basis, for instance. And so one example of, of a way to, to get access to this talent was Innocentive. And Innocentive is, is a network of about 250,000 scientists around the world. And you know, most of them are freelancers. Uh, many of them, they're distributed around the world. They're in universities, uh, they're in other places. And P 
P&G may be looking to solve a problem and they post it on the Innocentive network. Uh, if they can't solve it readily inside, they post it on the Innocentive network and chances are there's somebody in that network of 250,000 people who may have you know, just the right kind of combination of skills and expertise to solve the problem. They often find that the best kind of problem solving is cross-disciplinary when somebody who's in engineering or physics or something looks at a chemistry problem from a unique vantage point and is able to offer a unique kind of insight that they didn't find inside the company. Now the question is what happened to the 9,000 people who they employ full time? Well, they still employ 9,000 people. It's just it started to change the R&D function. So rather than invent everything inside, they realized that they had to change the incentive system so that you know, people who are in R&D and product development were rewarded for commercializing products, irregardless of whether they were invented initially inside P&G or they were invented somewhere, somewhere else. So this kind of approach you know, has increased R&D productivity by 60%. It's um, reduced their, their overall cost by a billion dollars and it's resulted in hundreds of new products in the market. And since 2000, it's been 10 years and they now estimate in fact they're sourcing more than 50% of all of their new product ideas from outside of the company. So that's just one example. You know, a, a more recent example would be Apple and the iPhone or for that matter, Google and, and the Android platform. You know, again, here you have a, a company which has developed a very successful product, but it's not a, you know, a, a typical static product in which you buy the product and, and then that's it. I mean, what they have done through the creation of the App Store is you know, they've unleashed this broad, vast ecosystem of software producers who can create interesting applications for the phone that Apple as a single company could never have produced. I mean, they have 300,000 apps available through the App Store. Apple probably creates 1% of those apps, if even that much. So here's the idea, you know, rather than create a traditional static product, you create a platform for innovation. You open it up so that you can take advantage of this large pool of, of people who are, you know, potentially going to develop new and innovative uses for that phone. And that's exactly what they've done, and it's a large part of their success. Again, you know, able this ability to tap into this large external pool of talent. Another example is Lego, a company which has been phenomenally successful in tapping into the ingenuity of its customers ultimately and every year they have a design competition where they have people between the ages of you know, 5 years old and 95 years old who actually download a little bit of software from the Lego website and they're able to design their own custom uh, Lego sets. Then they get the whole community involved in actually voting on what is the best design and the most popular design as judged by the community is actually put into production. And here's you know, where it gets really good because the person who did the design actually gets a 5% royalty on sales. So they actually have a real economic stake in, in what happens and they actually benefit commercially from the production of, of that particular Lego set. And I think the other thing that is, is important to, to recognize here is that it's not just large companies that can take advantage of this kind of mass collaboration or, use, or take advantage of the internet. In fact, you know, probably you know, the more important contribution here is to small companies who can now, in many respects, you know, entrepreneurs can tap into global capabilities, global networks to market their products on a global basis so that you know, rather than start, as a, you start out as a small local independent company, you can start to reach, you, know, you can go global from essentially day one. You could take advantage of, of Pinoco, which is this really innovative company which started out of New Zealand. And, and essentially what they have done is they've set up a system of contract manufacturing and, 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 and essentially you know, raw material sourcing where somebody can, who's a very clever designer can upload a design to Pinoco and Pinoco will help them source the manufacturing around the world and take care of the, you know, the customer fulfillment, you know, the shipping and logistics and everything else. So it's, a, it's essentially an out-of-the-box solution for somebody who has the creative input but doesn't have the kind of capital to invest in manufacturing facilities around the world. So you know, think about the kind of entrepreneurial potential that that could unleash, you know, where you know, all kinds of people from around the world could take advantage of this kind of system to get their products to you know, people who want to buy them uh, in a way that wouldn't have been possible even a few years ago. So that's a, you know, a quick look at, at some of the economic potential here. And, 
you know, we spent much of the past couple of years saying, well, if this is changing business, you know, surely there must be impacts in other institutions and, and surely, you know, governments must be thinking about how they can exploit mass collaboration to, you know, co-produce public services with citizens or get citizens more engaged in policy making or, you know, the healthcare system and other institutions would change and, and what we found is that, you know, that was exactly the case, you know, that there were profound changes happening in many other parts of society. So take healthcare as an example. You know, as, as individuals, we have, you know, traditionally been relegated to a very passive role in healthcare because doctors were, sent, you know, considered to be the only authoritative source of medical knowledge. And, you know, rightly so. You know, doctors undergo a lot of training to develop, you know, their knowledge and, and competency in delivering medical services and making important judgments and diagnoses. But, you know, you, you can't deny the fact that over the past 10 years, as individuals, we have access to this huge, enormous wealth of medical information online. And increasingly, you know, the, the quality of that information has gone up significantly. And I think people have become a lot more sophisticated about you know, how they navigate that information and how they make decisions. And of course, you would always recommend that, you know, everyone, anyone consult with their doctor when making these kind of decisions. But there certainly has been a shift in power where patients who used to be very passive are becoming much more active and claiming a much larger role in their healthcare. And there's many different examples of this and, and different levels of engagement. So you, know, you now see, for instance, you know, the ability of patients to actually rate the quality of their doctors and websites that have sprung up you know, to allow this kind of comparison so that people can, you know, if you're moving to a new region or a new location, you can look up on these kind of ratemymd.com and, and figure out, you know, what have other people said about the quality of this physician and the kind of service that they provide and it gives you access to information that you wouldn't have had before as a patient. And in the UK, they thought, you know, doctors don't kind of like this kind of, you know, stuff, but they thought, hey, this might be a good way for us to improve our healthcare system because we can get feedback directly from the patients about their experiences in particular hospitals and different wards of the hospital, you know. And, and as an institution like the NHS, they can start to target their resources for improvement to the kind of feedback that they're hearing from individual patients. So this has become essentially a, a very dynamic feedback system where they can learn from the whole community of users. And it's a very you know, different way of thinking about how to allocate resources. Now, you know, arguably, I talked about, you know, the connected underpants and the fact that, you know, increasingly we'll be able to monitor our vitals. And we're, we're finding that this, too, you know, drives a fairly important change in the way that, that people approach their health. Because what studies have shown is that when people monitor their health on a regular basis, you know, um, they're more committed to being healthy. It's kind of that you can't manage what you don't measure, ultimately, right? But when you are tracking your vitals on a, on a regular basis, you have the kind of data that you require to make more informed decisions about your lifestyle, how that affects your health, or more informed decisions, you know, to make in consultation with your doctor about, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the, the effectiveness of particular treatments, for instance. And for people with chronic conditions, this is, this is um, very important. They find, you know, people with diabetes in particular are finding these kind of health monitoring technologies are increasingly important and play a very important role in their health care. But arguably, even more important is this ability for people to form communities around specific conditions. And patients like me is, is a great example of how innovation over the internet can augment or complement traditional health care. It doesn't replace, none of this replaces what the existing medical community, uh, community provides, but it helps enhance the whole healthcare experience. So let's say, for instance, you have a very rare form of cancer or uh, a, a neurological disease or, or some sort of genetic condition that is you know, not very pr you know, prevalent in the overall population. The chances of you finding other people like you in your immediate community are, are fairly small. But on the internet, there could be thousands, you know, hundreds, even thousands of people with a very similar condition. And the ability to connected with those people can hugely uh, enhance your chances of coping effectively with your disease. A recent uh, study, again another medical study, found that actually loneliness and isolation were some of the biggest medical risk factors, even greater than smoking. Because when people are, are lonely and isolated, uh, they don't cope as well when managing their disease. They tend to be more depressed. You know, they're not as proactive and they don't have, you know, the source of 
of emotional and, and, and kind of you know, peer support that could enable them to cope much more readily with their condition. So through patients like me, you find people congregating around their conditions and sharing information and, and even, you know, this has uh, become a basis potentially for a more effective approach to clinical trials because you don't have to again rely on a particular university or, or hospital being able to aggregate a local population of patients because you can start to collect the data from a, a whole much larger population of patients across the internet. Now, naturally, this raises issues around privacy and other issues and security of data and so forth, but a lot of people who are on patients like me find that you know, the trade-offs in terms of you know, them disclosing more data about themselves than the other mice would have been very much worth it because they're getting a lot of value as individuals in return. So that's one example of healthcare. You know, how about government? Um, you know, we have a situation in North America and, in, and particularly in the U.S., uh, but you see this across Europe as well and certainly in Canada, where trust in elected officials has been dropping for about four decades, you know, certainly since, you know, the highs in the 1960s. And a lot of people have become increasingly disengaged with government. And we find that, you know, that's a fairly dangerous direction to be heading in, you know, in part because it erodes trust and legitimacy, but but also because, you know, we have immense challenges, you know, and governments are struggling in some ways to develop effective policies. And, you know, the way we think about it is, you know, you've got a large chunk of the population that could be contributing to effective policy development that is, uh, you know, that are effectively unengaged in government and that there's an opportunity here again to get citizens much more connected and engaged in the process of governing. You know, one great example, uh, and this is a, a recent initiative that the Obama administration undertook, was to launch something called challenge.gov. And on challenge.gov, it's a little bit like the Procter and, you know, Gamble example, but applied to government. There's a lot of big challenges that they face in terms of, you know, dealing with energy issues, dealing with, uh, you know, the fact that their uh, rates of educational achievement have been dropping significantly over the past couple of years, and they're no longer, you know, students in the U.S. are, are ranking, you know, in 30th and 40th place on, on lit literacy and, and mathematics and other things. So they, they've got these deep challenges, but they're not tapping into the ingenuity of their country as a whole. So on challenge.gov, an agency can launch a challenge and they can, you know, rather than rely on the people that they employ full time, they can start to tap into what entrepreneurs or, or, or people in universities could uh, potentially do to help solve the problem. So, you know, the Department of Energy has recently launched a fairly significant challenge to develop a 10 watt light bulb, you know, that would emit essentially the same amount of light as a 60 watt bulb. Um, but, you know, if it was developed, it could have a huge impact on energy conservation across the country. You know, so, and by putting a little bit of uh, money behind the effort, there's an incentive for entrepreneurs and other researchers to actually contribute to solving this issue. So it's a much more, you know, collaborative approach to thinking about, you know, how, how do we as institutions solve these really grand challenges that we face? And I think, you know, education is another area where we spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about, you know, how does the digital revolution change the nature of the university and higher learning and create new opportunities for a different type of pedagogy, a different type of teaching and learning. Um, you know, we make the joke, and it, it's maybe a little bit unfair, but quite honestly, I mean, in, in many respects, you've got an 18th century model of education in a 21st century world. I mean, if you could even go back further than that. I mean, people have suggested if you brought Plato or Aristotle back from the dead, they would feel completely comfortable in today's classroom because the modus of, of, of education hasn't really changed that much. It's still very much based around lecturing and, and, and conveying information to a very kind of passive audience and that you've got these young people coming into the educational system that have grown up interacting and, and collaborating and you know, want a, a more uh, interactive approach to education. Um, I think there's a, a lot of professors that, that realize this and have started to seize on the opportunities, but, you know, the point is, is that, you know, it's become fashionable. We were doing research, you know, talking to students about their experience of higher learning, and we found out that in a lot of the educational institutions, it's become fashionable to get an A without having attended a single lecture. You know, so in some ways, the cream of the crop, you know, the most skilled students are kind of boycotting the basic model of pedagogy. They don't find lectures to be 
that effective mode of, of, of learning. Now, that's not to say that lectures don't have their place, but the point is, is that you know, with the internet and with sites like TED, you can get access to high quality lectures from the world's most respected uh, authorities on, on any imaginable topic, right? And, and they're very accessible. So, so, so what use is you know, having necessarily a, a, a person you know, lecture when you can get access to um, you know, having a, a professor lecture when you can access to, to very high quality information on the web. Um, there's something called the Khan Academy. This um, guy, Solomon Khan, is actually Bill Gates' favorite teacher and he got a lot of press recently because of his you know, very innovative approach to using the web to uh, essentially you know, create a whole catalog of, of mathematics um, uh, they're not lectures, but they're more kind of interactive exercises. they are become hugely popular, and they're all produced, you know, essentially from his little studio that he has in his apartment, uh, and it's become hugely successful, and they're ultimately free, um, supported by the Gates Foundation and by advertising, but um, a very effective way of, of getting educational tools in the hands of students. But the, you know, the old notion that you have this kind of very siloed approach to education with you know very distinct universities I think is becoming a little bit of an anachronism you know it's no longer true that you know to get the best uh, information you have to go and, and seek out uh, a particular university or a particular set of professors and, and what we see is this incredible opportunity I think that Charles M. Vest who is the president emeritus of MIT probably put it best you know he said that you know, with open access publishing and with the web, you know, we've got this incredible opportunity to create essentially a meta-university. And, you know, MIT, is, as you know, uh, probably is, is one of the first institutions to put all of its courseware on the web. It's taken, you know, all of its uh, educational curriculum, a lot of its, um, uh, you know, the research documents and put them up on the web for free that, you know, could be utilized by teachers and, and professors and, and, for that matter, students around the world. And, he said this kind of activity, when you combine that with you know, the opening up of science in general, creates a huge uh, asset for the educational community, for students and professors to take advantage of this you know, very internetworked approach to the, the university. So you can imagine a scenario where, of course, you know, this doesn't diminish in any sense the role of the professor, I, I don't think, because they still have to help students you know, navigate this, this huge, you know, evolving world of information. They have to, you know, give students the critical thinking skills and they have to, in some ways, you know, put a, a, a layer of, um, you know, they're responsible, of course, for accrediting and, and judging the performance of different students. All of those things will probably remain, but, you know, the, the way that we navigate the whole system, you know, the ability to potentially tap into the brightest professors and to navigate a very customized course of education I think is, is very exciting. So uh, here's another example too, you know, in terms of people using digital technologies to create a more experiential form of learning, you know, one in which you are not just reading about what it's like to be a chemist, for instance, you can, in, in essence, experience, you know, what it's like to be a chemist, you know, using this virtual digital technology. And this professor uh, that we spoke to in researching the book at Cornell University had developed, you know, this whole, way that you know students could go into the virtual environment of second life and actually fabricate molecules um, you know using digital technologies and uh, you know, he found that this was much more uh, effective and much more engaging than a traditional textbook book approach to learning so I'll give one more example and then I want to sum up with a, a couple high-level principles and, and thoughts uh, and this one comes from the world of, of science, you know, another domain in which we've seen profound change in part because of the digital revolution and the possibilities that creates to, for scientists to network and share information. And this example comes from astronomy. It's, it's one of my favorites in the, in the new book and it, it kind of illustrates the real potential here. And it, it's, a, it's a project called Galaxy Zoo. And it started when a young PhD researcher was uh, essentially studying the evolution of, of galaxies across the universe. And he was particularly interested in, in, in how galaxies form and merge and evolve over time. And as part of his research, you know, he had to essentially classify 50,000 different galaxies. And as, you know, as a result of these new high power digital telescopes, they've got images of many more galaxies than we even knew existed. And they've got essentially a glut of data that they have to classify and analyze and understand and process. And 
he realized that you know, to complete his project to classify these 50,000 different galaxies into one or, or, or two different types would probably take a couple of years of effort. You know, even if he had a team of graduate students working with him, it was still going to take a very long time. And what he did is he, he had been inspired by Linux and other open source projects, and he thought, you know, what if I could get other people interested in helping me classify these images? And he spoke to his professors and colleagues, and they said, well, you could give it a shot. There might be 200 people in the world who are interested in, in helping out with this, but why not? And so he put the images online and he created a short tutorial so that anybody could, could look, you know, after 10 minutes and understand the difference between a spiral galaxy or an elliptical galaxy and they could tell the difference between the different patterns and they could help classify. And they thought, you know, let's see if the ordinary person off the street could do this. So they did a, a little experiment and they found that the ordinary person without any previous training in astronomy or astrophysics could actually classify the galaxies correctly 95% of the time, which is a, a very remarkable rate of accuracy. So they actually went ahead and launched the full experiment and they said, well, you know, let's see what happens. And then the story got onto the BBC and pretty soon they had not only a couple hundred, they had several thousand and then soon they had 150,000 and, and within weeks the community had grown to 250,000 people who were helping to classify these images. Within a couple of, of weeks, they had not only done the 50,000, they had actually gone through hundreds of thousands, and by the end of the project, over a couple of years, had classified millions of galaxies, exceeding by any estimation you know, the progress that they had ex expected to make in that field. I mean, it had advanced the whole field phenomenally in terms of the, the, you know, the amount of research they were able to complete. And just to give you a perspective in terms of the amount of talent they were able to tap into, the whole world contains about 6,000 astrophysicists. If you think about it, 6,000 in the entire world. So by you know, creating this crowdsourcing exercise, they were able to tap into 250,000 people. So they've essentially increased their talent pool by 40 times, you know, simply by opening this up. And, and, and here's, you know, there's all kinds of remarkable aspects of this story. I mean, it, I was sharing this, um, insight, I think it was over dinner or lunch yesterday, that you know, one of the people who was you know, really engaged by this whole activity happened to be a 25-year-old school teacher from the Netherlands. And one day she's classifying images and she sees a bright blue blob on, on one of the, the screens. And she doesn't know what it is. And it doesn't fit the taxonomy that the, the scientists had provided. And so she posts it to the discussion board and says, does anybody know what this you know, bright blue blob is? And nobody on the discussion boards can answer the question, so they say, why don't we ask the scientists, and the scientists have a look at it, and they don't know what it is either. So after a couple of weeks of investigation, they find out that actually this is a brand new celestial object that had never previously been identified by any trained astronomer or astrophysicist, and that this 25-year-old school teacher had added, made, you know, actually made a very novel discovery. And as it turns out, she's now the co-author of a major scientific paper, and she's not only the co-author, this new celestial object has actually been named after her, uh, which, you know, is amazing. Um, and what's neat to me, too, is that, you know, you find out that the, the community engaged in this is actually, this has become a social community. So the people now have meetups in London and Amsterdam and New York, and they get together and talk about you know, their experiences, and a lot of new friendships have been developed as a result. And the researchers, you know, they don't take this for granted. You know, they actually think of this community as an extension of their research ecosystem. And they actually, they release findings to the community before they actually publish in scientific journals because they realize that in order to keep this group of people involved and engaged, you know, they've got to treat them as collaborators, not just as, you know, you know this kind of raw, you know, resource that they can potentially tap into. So this has actually changed a lot of people's thinking about what ordinary people can potentially contribute to science. And now you've got people across a whole range of different fields saying, how can we tap into similar opportunities? I mean, you know, the possibility for scientists just to collaborate globally in and of itself is a huge opportunity. And you find that, you know, most fields today increasingly operate globally, um, as, you know, as opposed to the old model where it was, you know, based on kind of very specific universities or it was kind of national based collaborations. Well, you know, you speak to people now and they say, well, 
you know, the moment I, I announce a new project, I've got people from around the world wanting to pitch in. So this has really changed the whole fabric of, of, of science in a very profound way. So what kind of principles can we take away from all of these different experiences? And as organizations and even as individuals, you know, how could we start to think about how we maybe replicate some of these successes, you know, from the business world to the, the world of, of government and healthcare and science? And, and we have essentially distilled it down to five key principles, collaboration, openness, sharing, integrity and interdependence. And I can assure you that, you know, when you stand up in front of a, a traditional business crowd, people have become a little bit more receptive recently, but most people say, well, these don't sound like conventional business principles to me. I mean, openness, sharing, collaboration, what happened to competition and, you know, kill your competitor and that kind of stuff. But we find that, you know, in all honesty, this stuff, this stuff actually works. And let, let me explain why these, these five principles are, are really important. Collaboration, I think a lot of people get that now. They understand why collaboration is important because they understand that no matter you know, how big or successful your company may be or, or if you're not in a company, you know, just replace that with government agency or healthcare institution or educational institution. You know, there's this vast pool of external talent that is you know, always going to be able to contribute to innovation or product development or enhance whatever it is you're doing. And, a lot of people think that you know, collaboration is about better teamwork within a department, and that is certainly one aspect of collaboration, but what we have found that as a result of the internet is that you can actually, you can start to, to really grow that collaborative community. It can start to go beyond the department to the entire enterprise. It can go beyond the enterprise to a broader ecosystem. You know, you take the example of, of Apple, which has this whole ecosystem of, of business partners that contribute to developing apps for the App Store. Well, it can go beyond the business ecosystem, potentially to the world. You know, you've got Procter & Gamble that says, yeah, we've got some pretty smart scientists. We've got 9,000 people in R&D, but we've got another 1.8 million people outside that we can potentially tap into. So, you know, we're, 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 we're tapping the whole world. We, we consider the world to be our R&D department in a very real in practical way. Uh, and I think that, you know, that is the inherent power of collaboration, that you can e expand not only the number of people that you can collaborate with and you can get new ideas from, but that you can increase, and this is the important part, the diversity of the ideas and the talent that you can potentially uh, bring to the table on any particular problem that you're trying to, to solve. And that, you know, diversity of, of thought, of capability, of skills is what you know, makes a huge difference for, for many of the companies that we've seen succeeding with this approach. Now, openness uh, is, is very important too because it's very hard to collaborate if you're opaque, if you're, not, if you're not open, if you're not transparent. And, you know, recently we've seen, of course, with WikiLeaks, and, and this has been a general trend now for, for many years, that the whole world is in many ways becoming more transparent. But in cases like WikiLeaks, it's transparency being forced on, in some cases, uh, organizations that um, haven't really, you know, they haven't really embraced the whole value of openness. But, you know, what we find from these examples is that, you know, even, you know, the largest, uh, one of the largest military organizations in the world or organizations like, you know, the U.S. State Department can no longer monopolize and control information. So now the question is, as an organization, would you rather be you know, have your information forcibly disclosed, or would you rather be proactive about transparency and create and foster a culture of openness? And, you know, what we find is that if you want to develop trust, if you want to foster collaboration, you have to give people information. You have to you know, build that trust and earn that trust through openness, because the moment you start to hide stuff, you, know, you foster suspicion, you, you foster uh, potentially negative uh, sentiments. So you know, we think openness is an important part of the equation here. Now, we would go so far as to say that you can go beyond simply sharing pertinent information to actually sharing intellectual property. And this is one of the principles that gets most under the skin of business people because they say, sharing intellectual property? Are you crazy? I mean, isn't that sort of the antithesis of business? I mean, isn't that, in an essence, communism? And, and we say no because it's not about you know, sharing all of your patents or sharing all of your intellectual property. It's about sharing you know, the aspects of your overall portfolio of intellectual property that can potentially further your business goals or that can you know, potentially 
have you know, positive uh, repercussions for an entire industry. And let me, let me give you a couple of examples, or at least one example that I find is, is particularly powerful. And it's Nike. Nike recently started an initiative called the Green Exchange, and they're collaborating with Best Buy and a whole bunch of other companies on this, this uh, Green Exchange. And the idea here is that Nike and other companies are beginning to become leaders in what you would call green technology innovation. They're starting to find ways to manufacture apparel and other products, like clothing, in a more environmentally responsible way. Now, in many cases, companies are reinventing the wheel because all companies are trying to figure out in some form or another, you know, how can we become more sustainable? How can we become more green? But in, in, in a lot of cases, these you know, particular innovations don't contribute directly to their competitive advantage. So, for instance, Nike has a new form of green rubber, you know, a form of, of rubber which is less toxic, less polluting, which they can use in the soles of their shoes, which they've now put into, into use. Now, the problem that Nike has is that it's very expensive to manufacture this green rubber because the kind of raw materials they need to manufacture the rubber uh, and the economies of scale that would kind of make that more efficient just don't exist. So they said, we're going to share this green rubber with everyone, including our competitors. You know, does Adidas want to use it? Go ahead and use it because actually it's a benefit to us. If we get the economies of scale, if we get you know, we can actually lower the cost of producing these shoes and then the whole industry potentially benefits. Um, you know, we saw that uh, another similar example in the pharmaceutical industries where initially in the Human Genome Project in the 1990s, a lot of companies were developing their own proprietary maps of the human genome. And they realized at a certain point that it didn't make sense. You know, at the end of the day, we needed one scientifically valid map of the human genome and we would get there a lot faster if companies actually contributed their research to the public domain. And so through a collaboration with you know, government authorities and companies, they were actually able to you know, complete the human genome project much more quickly than they otherwise would have, in part because of this more enlightened approach to sharing, realizing that they may be sharing <clears throat> some of the fundamental research, but they were all going to still compete ultimately on the commercialization of new medicines and new products. So sometimes it's about trying to figure out, you know, what aspects of value creation do we want to compete on and, and where do we want to share and potentially further and accelerate the pace of, of discovery in our, in our industry. Now, two more principles, and they're, they're both related, and I think they're, they're both increasingly important. And the first one of the last two is integrity. That increasingly I think it's important for companies to have good values to act with honesty and integrity and accountability and to be you know more socially and environmentally responsible um, you know we have seen recently you know the repercussions you know what happens when businesses lose their moral companies you know when they aren't transparent or they don't act with integrity we get problems like you know the financial crisis uh, but on the other hand we have seen, you know, companies starting to address, you know, major problems in collaboration with other stakeholders. You know, the diamond industry recently came together with a whole bunch of governments across Africa and a major a set of major NGOs and human rights organizations to create a more transparent diamond supply chain so that they could start to address the whole issue of conflict diamonds and, you know, the issues of corruption and, and slavery that have plagued that industry. And they have a certification process now where and a monitoring process that is overseen by third-party NGOs. And I'll have to say, you know, the diamond industry didn't come to this willingly at first. There had to be, you know, years of pressure from Human Rights Watch and other NGOs to say, look, you know, there's a real issue here, and this is leading to civil wars, and it's leading to, you know, ethnic strife, and it's, it's causing a lot of hardship for people. But eventually, the diamond companies, you know, they realized, De Beers and, and other companies realized that, you know, this would be a more sustainable approach and one that you know, ultimately would lead to a more responsible industry. We've seen this mining companies now through this extractive transparency uh, initiative are sharing information about the bribes that they potentially receive in, in different countries, again, to try and shine light on the issue of corruption. We've seen the chocolate industry come together to address issues of slavery in the cocoa supply chain. Again, kind of like the diamond industry, you found that, you know, chocolate manufacturers had literally said the we're not responsible for slavery in, in West Africa, in, in the cocoa fields. Um, but, you know, they, you know, the human rights organizations again said, well, look, you know, you're ultimately manufacturing the, 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 
the chocolate and you're buying the cocoa off the commodity exchanges, but that doesn't mean that your responsibility ends ultimately with you know your your purchasing of, of the commodities on the commodity exchange. You know, you're making huge profits off chocolate. Shouldn't some of that responsibility be invested you know be invested in in improving the labor conditions for workers? And they have come together to address this issue. So you know we have seen lots of examples where companies can be good corporate citizens and, and do it collectively in industry through a collaborative process. And ultimately, I think interdependence is a very important principle too. If we think about you know, the big challenges that I talked about you know, earlier in the opening, you know, food, uh, rising food prices, water shortages, climate change. You know, we, we live ultimately on a very small planet and with you know, potentially nine billion people to support, we are going to seriously test the limits of our inge you know, ingenuity in, in terms of developing new technical approach approaches, new you know, uh, social approaches to dealing with these kind of issues. So I think you know, the more that you know, companies and other organizations realize the limits of the existing paradigm to solving global problems. I mean, we, we have a, a nation-based system, a nation-state-based system for solving problems, which has been, you know, by and large, I think, fairly ineffective in, in many different instances in, in actually you know, leading to change. And I think the more that we recognize the interdependence and the more that we can fashion global communities of interest that can solve these problems, the better off and the more quickly the problems will get resolved. And I think I will, I will leave it at that. And I know that uh, we probably have many questions, but thank you very much for being such an attentive audience. And I hope that this has both shed light on, on the possibility of mass collaboration, both you know, organizationally, but potentially too for you as individuals thinking about you know, how you could benefit from this trend. So thank you again.